We completed last time our study of the chapter titled The Soul and Nature in which Sri Aurobindo took up the first important principle in creation which is of the duality which resolves itself into unity of Purusha and Prakriti. The poise of consciousness which is aware but incapable of action and the poise of energy which is action seemingly separate from awareness. Between these two we saw a complex relationship originating in the lowest material experience as nature trying to form the individual and the consciousness and on the other side consciousness feeling itself a product of nature and yet secretly sensing a greater freedom and a responsibility not only to recover that freedom and control over itself but a responsibility for what it does and even to turn upon nature and make her make the circumstances better. Between this play Sri Aurobindo took the framework of the sixfold relationship described in the Bhagavad Gita where the Purusha can be at first a poise which is merely a witness but from there in the witness itself is implied the upholder without whose presence the movement of the energy of nature would not be and in that is the source of sanction by which the consciousness can choose what is sanctioned what is encouraged what is discouraged and in this the discovery that that which is known in the consciousness is what nature works out and so the poise of the knower and from there the conscious exercise of that knowledge which leads to the lordship and the poise of the enjoyer. With each change in the position of the consciousness nature also shifts in the relationship and plays out differently in relation to the consciousness. Ultimately the two joining at their peak in one movement which takes the poise of consciousness and energy of consciousness. So in this play we, we found these six facets of relationship and now looking at it from this perspective it almost suggests something which we will touch upon and then move on. The poise of witness is the best that you can gain in the physical world because nature is so comprehensive you can only become a point of consciousness that is aware and so it seems the most natural poise in the physical consciousness but as you emerge from the physical body into the life energies there you discover that the consciousness is surrounded by this flowing energy what holds the world the center of it is this awareness and so in the vital consciousness or in the vital world in the vital body the relationship becomes much more that of upholder the center of the storm so to say of the whirling energies as you rise more into the mental awareness where the mind is conscious we discover there also the sense of choice and the source of sanction becomes the most natural relationship in the awakening mind but it is not yet the domain of true knowledge he becomes knower only as he rises above mind into a consciousness which can truly know the intuitive or above that ascending towards the true knowledge of the omniscient supermind but the mastery comes only from the poise of the supermind and the delight which is of the Satchidananda which is also held there. So you see here in the lower triple world the three lower relationships 
ascending into the sp divine consciousness in spirit, the three upper relationships. And it gives you an interesting hint that in fact, this play of soul and nature and the various shades of the play is what creates the sense of levels or grades of consciousness in the world. This is a deep truth that Sri Aurobindo will come to in the chapter after the next, which he call, which is titled The Planes of Our Existence. There he will show you how Satchidananda hidden inside and the different ways and degrees to which it reveals itself form the planes of consciousness. And in that chapter we will find all the secrets of the relationship between the higher planes and the lower and especially the material plane and even the essential principles upon which all of the esoteric and the occult knowledge is based. But I am anticipating only to highlight how important this relationship of soul and nature is to which he has given a whole chapter. But the culmination of the chapter was the realization of the unity of both in their origin. In Satchidananda, the Sat, the self-conscious existence, the essential nature of being, that is Purusha. And the consciousness of that existence and the power of that self-awareness is the energy, the conscious energy, which is the Prakriti. And their play, their meeting, their eternal union is the Ananda. And if this is the truth right at the top of the cosmos, it is also the truth all the way down into the most material physical plane. And that's how we will see the levels of consciousness formed in the play of Satchit and Ananda, the different ways in which these three things are modified in the relationship make for the distinct gradations of the planes. Now once we have seen this big picture, once we realize that the relationship of soul and nature is oneness in the very basis of our existence, in the very essentiality of being, and the play is the base of the delight. Recall the last sentence of the last chapter. The absolute joy of the soul in itself and based upon that the absolute joy of the soul in nature are the divine fulfillment of the relation. In the supreme relation of Purusha and Prakriti. Then we have come now to extraordinary vision. The whole universe is only he and she and the play of Purusha and Prakriti, the two who are always one. On every plane, it is the two who are always one. And it's only their hide and seek and the complex layers of play that they set between themselves, which make for the complexity of the universe. If this be the case, it changes the whole vision of the yoga. And so we begin the next chapter the soul and its liberation. And Sri Aurobindo begins the chapter with this sentence, we have now to pause and consider to what this acceptance of the relations of Purusha and Prakriti commits us. The need to pause means he is not going to move immediately into the topic of how from Sachidananda the oneness becoming two forms all the planes. That will be the chapter after. This chapter is the pause to consider what this means, the implications of this unity. So keeping this in mind, we will look at this chapter and then the discussion itself will continue into the next. Once you accept this relationship, it commits you to something. For it means that the yoga which we are pursuing has for end none of the ordinary aims of humanity. What are the ordinary aims of humanity? Well, I want to have peace, I want to live in joy, I want to be free, I want to get out of this mess. And even with all that, or I want to now conquer this mess, make myself comfortable. But even the higher aims which you see in the spiritual pursuits get out entirely from the mess, 
or discard the mess and the confusion that it contains and the darkness and so on. It neither accepts our earthly existence as it is, nor can be satisfied with some kind of moral perfection or religious ecstasy, with a heaven beyond, or with some dissolution of our being by which we get satisfactorily done with the trouble of existence. So broadly three categories of solutions that humanity has set for itself. One is to accept earthly existence as it is. Well, that's how it is. Get on with it, make the most of it. It's the most common way of managing life. And to the extent that you can, you draw upon some of the resources, some of the powers of nature to make yourself a little more comfortable until, well, life ends, as far as possible, comfortably. That's not acceptable, because you realize that nature is power of self. Nature and soul are meant to play out the game of the delight of Satchidananda. And to accept things for what they are is foolish and also not satisfying. If you knew that this game could become an expression of real delight and real joy and awakened consciousness and a free play of the knowledge and power of consciousness, why would you accept to remain in this darkened, pointless game? So that is not acceptable in any case. Nor can be satisfied with some kind of moral perfection or religious ecstasy. With a heaven beyond or some dissolution of our being. So the other way is simply to say, look, this is a difficult situation to be in life, but you must live by your standards, be the best that you can be, and well, the rest doesn't matter, it's not in your concern. And this is often what you see, even in the non-religious life, the highest that is seen, sometimes in the religions also, a similar thought. Or religious ecstasy, occasionally, in a heightened state, in some altered awareness, you have an ecstatic experience and then you are back to pretty much your normal life. Today, instead of religious ecstasy for this kind of an exposure, many seek a non-religious chemical trip or using plants, mushrooms or uh, sophisticated new chemicals which are pumped into the body to shift the state of awareness and give you some kind of religious ecstasy without the religion component from which you come back into your normal life. All the more frustrated because of the opposition of these two. Or with the heaven beyond, which would be the other option of the religions which say, you know what, you must pass through this after you die, you will get a better life if you have fulfilled those requirements. Even that is not acceptable because Purusha and Prakriti here are meant to realize their bliss, not in some after and beyond. Or with some dissolution of our being by which we get satisfactorily done with the trouble of existence. Get out of the game. Dissolve yourself sufficiently that you are no more bothered and the game itself is pointless or ceases to be. Or you withdraw so much that the game becomes a very distant superficiality, almost illusory, doesn't matter. I live in my contentment or bliss, whatever that poise is. Our aim becomes quite other. Because in all these you have accepted nature as it is. Our aim now cannot accept nature as it is. It is to live in the divine, the infinite, in God, and not any mere egoism and temporality. But at the same time, not apart from nature, from our fellow beings, from earth and the mundane existence, any more than the divine lives aloof from us and the world. 
So at the same time where we want to become free, we want to live in the divine, the infinite, in God, not in some mere egoism and temporary uh, appearance, but at the same time we want also that nature to not be abandoned because it is power of self that is being expressed. You cannot be in God and abandon, abandon power of God. Or if you may take a more um, obvious aspect to say, we will accept the left side of God and ignore the right side. It doesn't make sense. If you have accepted nature as an expression of the divine consciousness and power, then you must equally accept what? Not apart from nature, capital N. Now this is a very broad term. It includes everything that makes up our mind, life energies, body, and all substance and on all planes, which is nature. And then more specifically, we cannot live apart from our fellow beings, because that also is part of this larger movement, in which while you may say, yes, in each one there is the divine presence, but still they are fellow beings, forms of nature which have been created out of her play, and from earth. And this is not just the physical earth, but all of the material plane. If this is also formed of that same creative power which emerges from the Satchidananda and is still here secretly the Satchidananda, you cannot discard matter and our earth. And the mundane existence, what is this mundane existence which you see in the routine of life you could have said, oh, this is inferior life. This is to be abandoned. This is what you withdraw from. But you can't do that either. This too is nature. This too is part of the divine creation. If it is there, you cannot ignore it. You have to be participating in it as much as in that poise of the freedom in the, in the divine, infinite and God. So, any more than the divine lives aloof from us and the world. If we live in the divine, you cannot say that I will live in the divine, but the divine can continue to live in the world, but I will live separate from the world. Because the divine is embracing all this, including the mud, including the worm in the mud, including the most trivial things, or the most ugly even. It is the divine presence that is there. You cannot ignore that. And so the whole relationship is going to change with nature and with life. He exists also in relation to the world and nature and all these beings, but with an absolute and inalienable power, freedom and self-knowledge. So consider the poise of the divine. When the whole world bursts out of his consciousness, he supports that consciousness. He is that consciousness. Is he at any point bound by the flows of forms that are created? He always remains in a power, freedom and knowledge of himself and what he expresses to be, which is absolute and inalienable. At no point is he lost in the play and nothing of the play can ever reduce or limit the power, the freedom and the self-knowledge. So in the lines which we saw earlier, when he was describing this play of the relationship of the divine to the world, he has these very beautiful lines, Sri Aurobindo writes, He is the maker, capital M, and the world he made is also he. He is the vision and he is the seer. He is himself the actor and the act. He is himself the knower and the known. He is himself the dreamer and the dream. And so if the divine is at once that and this, he exists also in relation to the world and nature and all these things, beings. So our liberation and perfection is to transcend ignorance, bondage and weakness and live in him in relation to the world and nature with 
the divine power, freedom and self-knowledge. So we want to live in his consciousness the way he relates to the world, but with that same divine power, freedom and self-knowledge, not his absolute degree perhaps, but with the same character of it. But to get to that poise also we need to transcend ignorance, bondage and weakness. All the things which have been discussed in previous chapters of the awakening of consciousness. So we see two things, the soul awakening to freedom and at the same time from the poise of freedom embracing the play of the world in the same way as the divine embraces his nature. For the highest relation of the soul to existence is the Purusha's possession of Prakriti. When he is no longer ignorant and subject to his nature, but knows, transcends, enjoys and controls his manifested being and determines largely and freely what shall be his self-expression. So this will be the poise we have to grow into. The highest relation of the soul to existence is this. Purusha's possession of Prakriti. And so we have seen what that means in the earlier discussion. But now he elaborates. When he is no longer ignorant and subject to his nature, that means we are no more a product of nature's process. We have risen out of that into a freedom. No more subjection in a complete freedom but knows, transcends, enjoys and controls what? His own manifested being. So nature now is merged, joined into Purusha. It is his own being that flows out to become the universe. And so he, there is a double poise in the same consciousness in which he knows, transcends, enjoys first. And then comes the last word, controls. His being which is manifesting and determines largely and freely what shall be his self-expression. So as the actor and the act, he is himself both, remember. He chooses how to play out this act. He is himself the actor even as he works out the movement of the act. Largely and freely, meaning broad movements are set. It does not mean we control all the details. If all the details were under our control at each moment, it would be a bit of a uh, limitation to the game. There would not be the sense of freedom in the play. That's why he puts this word largely and freely. So the sense of surprise happens in the play when although we have set a broad term of direction freely, and we can choose to maintain that direction without any limitation. There are still things in the nature of the play that throw up surprises and new challenges and wonders to be discovered. This is the nature of the play in which the soul participates. From the divine consciousness which includes all these, there may be a perfect knowledge of everything down to the tiniest detail. But when the soul takes the true relation, it has a broad, large sense, always in freedom. But there's still the scope of surprises and unfolding of wonder. This is now the direction that the yoga has to take. We cannot accept the earlier goals. A oneness finding itself out in the variations of its own duality is the whole play of the soul with nature in its cosmic birth and, be, and becoming. Now this paragraph which we take up is one of the most extraordinary, the most beautiful, the most profound and uh, the most essential as we will see in the unfolding of these lines. He is going to show us how the oneness is working in all these multifaceted plays. Remember, the way it works, there is one consciousness, indivisible. That indivisible consciousness by its own power of creative awareness moves out 
to become so many different possibilities all simultaneously. And then it plays them out between each other to form the sense of space, of relationships and unfolds them to form the sense of time. And within each of these forms, which is so emerging from the same oneness, is the same oneness hidden to break out all other possibilities that it can express. And within each of those, again, there is the same oneness breaking out infinite possibilities. And within each of those possibilities, infinite possibilities. How many layers? Not two, not three, not seven, not a million. Infinite, unendingly. And so what we see in the most material domain is an infinity of infinitesimals. Okay? The oneness seeming as if to diversify infinitely and within each diversity, again infinite diversity, within each of those, again infinite. How far does it go? Measurelessly limiting itself, infinitely limiting itself to what is called infinitesimal. It is as if something could be divided infinitely, what would it be as a measure? You cannot measure, it is so tiny infinitesimal. How many of those? An infinity of infinitesimals makes for an appearance of one finite shape. When you look at the flower, take a piece of it, tear out one petal, let's say. What is it made of? An infinity of infinitesimals. Cut that into a half. What is that made of? Infinity of infinitesimals. Cut that into half. You can go on dividing infinitely and still there's an infinity of infinitesimals. But this is just form that we're looking at. Look at the colors. Do you see all the shades from a light pink to a dark reddish? And in between all the fine nuances and fibers of play of color. And if you go deep into it between any two color, you'll find fine shades. And an infinity of infinitesimals of color. And in the perfume, as you breathe the perfume of the flower, you will find also an infinity of infinitesimals in the variations of the perfume. In the very touch, there is an infinity of infinitesimals that is meeting in your finger, an infinity of infinitesimals. And we have to start looking at the whole universe in this way. And who is meeting what when my finger touches the flower? It is the same oneness that formed the finger which is meeting the same oneness that formed the flower petal. As I breathe the perfume, it is the same oneness that formed the nose and its fine sensors meeting the fine molecules released from the flower, which is also the same oneness. And it is in my mind which enjoys the same oneness, enjoying the sense of flower, which is the same oneness. And everything is a oneness meeting oneness. So, a oneness finding itself out in the variations of its own duality. Now, in the variations of its own duality means in the Purusha stance and the Prakriti stance, there are variations. In the Purusha, we saw broadly six facets of how it can relate to Prakriti. But there are only six facets for the purpose of our mind's understanding. We saw how each blends into the next, how all six are simultaneously present and they are in between shades between them. It's an infinite spectrum of relations that are held in relation to Prakriti. Within that, the enjoyment even has an infinity of variations and colors of how you enjoy Prakriti. When you enjoy the beauty of the flower, there is the visual enjoyment, there is the nuances of color, there is the form of the shape, there is the size, there is the touch, there is the smell, and all of these are variations of the enjoyment alone. And equally there is the aspect which can be equally the observer that says, ah, this flower versus that, how shall I categorize them? And the observer trying to grow into a knower partially, but creating a very different experience, not enjoying at all the sense of the flower, but the categories that it sees in the universe and trying to place in relation to the all. All these are infinite variations of enjoyment, of infinite variations of all the six facets blending into each other infinitely. 
So, <clears throat> the poise of Purusha itself has infinity of relationships. And on the other side, Prakriti throwing upon Purusha all possible variations of her play, infinitely varied. So, a oneness, which is the origin of both, finding itself out in the variations of its own duality. And always it's the oneness that is finding itself. Is the whole play of the soul with nature in its cosmic birth and becoming. So soul is born, nature is born in the cosmic play. There is the becoming of the play as it unfolds and all the time it is oneness finding itself out in the variations of its own duality. And remember, in every finding, it is the delight of the soul meeting nature. It is the ananda aspect of the sat chit ananda, which is the purpose of this whole self-finding. Now we have a broad, large vision. Into this vision now he will bring layer by layer something even more complete. One Satchidananda everywhere. Self-existent, illimitable, a unity indestructible by the utmost infinity of its own variations is the original truth of being for which our knowledge seeks and to that our subjective existence eventually arrives. So first is the way our knowledge is seeking what? What is it seeking? One Satchidananda which is everywhere. And you look at the whole universe and all the worlds and all the planes and all the infinity of variations of infinitesimals in every way and shade possible. And the whole play of oneness, finding oneness across it all is one gigantic Satchidananda. There is nothing else except one Satchidananda everywhere. Existing how? Self-existent. It is that aspect of self-existent which is the sense of the Purusha which is everywhere. Illimitable. Nothing can be ever place any limit in what is possible. Not only for it to conceive itself to be, but for it to deploy and become without limits. What an extraordinary universe in which everything is possible without ever meeting a limit. The universe itself, infinite, even for us to conceive of what that could be, stuns the mind. And into that, every possibility is going to be worked out or can be worked out freely. Self-existent, illimitable, a unity indestructible by the utmost infinity of its own variations. And this unity, the oneness is so deep, so complete, that you can go on breaking apart into variations, you can go on breaking out into infinities of infinities of infinities. And never will you lose that unity. A unity indestructible. What an extraordinary vision. And this is the original truth of being for which our knowledge seeks. What are you looking for in trying to know? Know the world, know yourself, know your place in it. It is this which you are ultimately seeking. Because you are this Satchidananda, world is this Satchidananda, and your place in it is the Ananda of this Satchidananda. And so all of your knowledge ultimately seeks this truth of being. We are this Satchidananda in its totality. And to that our subjective existence eventually arrives. So while our knowledge is seeking this objectively to understand the world and my place, subjectively as my consciousness grows, I also awaken to the experience of this oneness of Satchidananda. Everywhere, one, self-existent, illimitable, a unity indestructible by the most infinity. Push the infinity as far as you can. Infinity of infinities. The unity still holds it all. 
from that all other truths arise. Upon that they are based. By that they are at every moment made possible. And in that they in the end can know themselves and each other are reconciled, harmonized and justified. This is the vision, this vision is the foundation. From that all other truths arise. What are these other truths? Every law that you could discover in your mind's seeking, every experience that you find to be a rhythm in nature, every physical law, every knowledge, field of knowledge, every way of organizing, categorizing, every way of experiencing the universe. All of these are truths. They arise from this oneness, which is everywhere, a unity, indestructible, self-existent, without limits. So, from that all other truths arise. Upon that they are based. If you take up any truth, even a mentally formulated law, E equals MC square, or a psychological principle that whatever you are, whatever your state of consciousness, you will attract the same kind. Or you can take a spiritual truth that eventually all things which are transitory will break, will fade and only that which is essentially true will last. Take anything, you, will, you can ask why is it so? You'll find perhaps a deeper principle. And you could ask, why is it so? And eventually you will resolve back to this grand vision of the Satchidananda. In this vision you will find the foundation upon which everything, all other truths become explained. Why is E equals MC square? You can literally go from the physics of it and go down to this underlying truth of the Satchidananda. And it is extraordinary to experience how these things, support, how this vision supports all these truths. From that all other truths arise, upon that they are based. By that they are at every moment made possible. It means all other truths are transitory truths or are not in themselves essential truths. They are supported by this essential truth. Think of it like this, everything in the universe as a truth, even the existence of this flower as a truth, everything is upheld by this underlying Satchidananda. Arising out of it, based upon it and at every moment they are made possible because of this underlying Satchidananda. The vision it gives to you is that any truth would immediately dissolve, cease to be true if not for the constant upholding and support of this foundation of the Satchidananda, the oneness, infinite, everywhere, and illimitable, a unity indestructible by the utmost infinity. This is the foundation. By that they are at every moment made possible, and in that, they, in the end, can know themselves and each other. So when the truth itself says, but why am I so? Why am I existing? And you could say this for an abstract, mentally conceived truth, like why is this law so? Or the flower would ask, could ask itself, why do I exist? Or I can ask myself, what is my purpose in existing as a conscious being? Eventually you can know yourself only in this underlying oneness and its nature. But also each other. The flower can say, why is that flower different from this flower? Or the flower can say, why did the gardener pluck me from the plant? How did I emerge from the plant? Why do I have to die? And the human being could ask these same questions. Why did I ever enter into this mess of the world? Why am I in ignorance? Why am I struggling to emerge? Why do I have to die? Why do I have to be born? Anything you ask. 
know yourself and know your relationship with the others why does the flower exist you could if human beings were just meant to grow into um, their own awakening you didn't need all these flowers and plants you could just have human beings meeting each other and fighting their way through to awakening why make this whole universe so beautiful and yet so terrible so sweet and yet bitter at the same time and the answer to that you will find in this underlying infinity bursting out to play out all its possibilities never losing its oneness because it's possible because it wants to express its illimitable infinity and because the oneness is so complete that all the bursting out freely unendingly will still be held in it to be enjoyed as facets of its own delight of oneness meeting oneness in every possible way that would be the full richness of the delight and so they can know themselves and each other only in this and are reconciled harmonized and justified again three words which suggest very deep things first if this seems to contradict that you must find some underlying common basis upon which the two can be reconciled and if you keep going down to a deeper and deeper common base you will come back to this oneness of the sachidananda eventually it's an interesting exercise that is useful for training of the mind you take any statement which is true and then you make a statement which is its very opposite and then discover the truth in it and now find the common basis upon which both are seen to be facets of a deeper truth and having got to a deeper basis make the opposite of this statement and then find a deeper base in which both of these are united and so on where will it end eventually it will resolve itself into this vision in which every opposite is reconciled and seen to be an aspect of the sachidananda equally as the other which is an aspect of the sachidananda they are reconciled now you can see why they exist but how do they work together how can two opposite things work together only if they realize their expressions of the same oneness of sachidananda and that's when they are harmonized so first reconciled which moves to harmonized and then in that oneness of sachidananda and its multiplicity of play you realize if not for both the one could not be and so they are justified the fact that there is the very opposite of this opposing it is justified now in the underlying oneness where you can see now you can know that this was needed for this to be and they are still harmonized and reconciled and justified and this i reread the sentence now you see what it builds from that all other truths arise upon that they are based by that they are at every moment made possible and in that they in the end can know themselves and each other are reconciled harmonized and justified all relations in the world even to its greatest and most shocking apparent discords are relations of something eternal to itself in its own universal existence you pick the most extreme the most opposite the most shocking apparent discords all relations in the world are relations of something eternal to itself in its own universal existence it being here that sachidananda this relationship which is so shocking so contrary so contradictory is still a relationship of something to itself this also is sachidananda this also is sachidananda this is sachidananda meeting sachidananda oneness meeting oneness even though it appears the most shocking and extreme greatest discord in the universal existence you see them as meeting of oneness with oneness 
they are not anywhere or at any time collisions of disconnected beings who meet fortuitously or by some mechanical necessity of cosmic existence. There is nothing which is two separate pieces disconnected. There is only the oneness of which there are expressions and aspects. And so when they meet, their meeting is also not just a chance collision, fortuitously, or some mechanical necessity because this is how the machinery of cosmos moves to bring them together. The truth is behind that is the oneness of Sachidananda choosing in the play to meet itself in this way. No mechanical compulsion nor fragmented pieces. Everything is oneness, consciously choosing to meet itself for its own play of the bliss. Therefore, to get back to this eternal fact of oneness is our essential act of self-knowledge. So if you want to have any kind of a right relation with the world or even right relation with yourself, you have to get back to this because this is the root of it all. Getting back to this will mean all things now will be known in their right relation. So to get back to the eternal fact of oneness is our essential act of self-knowledge. To live in it must be the effective principle of our inner possession of our being and of our right and ideal relation with the world. So you want to get back to yourself, get back to the oneness. And then from there you want to find your right relation both to know yourself and to know the world where well, this is the base on which that will be. To live in it, to know it is one thing and then to be in it in the midst of all activities of life. So you can know it in a state of deep concentration, you reach that oneness and now you can see why the world is what it is, why everything is justified and the whole sense of the movement of awakening and self-discovery of Satchidananda and the oneness and bliss. You come out of that and you have understood, you are no more troubled by appearances, but you may still struggle to find the right balance and the right action with things. Unless that poise now becomes constantly the base upon which you continue to see and assess and act. When that happens, every action will be also spontaneously in the right relation. So, to live in it must be the effective principle of our inner possession of our being and of our right and ideal relation, relations with the world. To possess yourself and then also to enter in relation with the world for both, you have to live in this oneness. That is why we have had to insist first and foremost on oneness as the aim. And in a way, the whole aim of our yoga of knowledge. And you see why that insistence was there. And the whole previous two chapters were all on this theme of oneness. And then seeing from the oneness of all the other principles are reconciled and this is the base upon it. That is why we have had to insist first and foremost. We could have said, all right, we'll come to the oneness later. Let's solve these practical issues first. No, we got to it first because then all the issues are resolved. Also foremost, among all the different approaches by which you could have resolved your issues, this is the most important because all others derive from it. Oneness as the aim and in a way the whole aim of the yoga of knowledge. Not only it's the aim, but the, the whole aim. It's as if everything else will emerge from it so spontaneously, you need not even worry about it. It's the whole aim. But it's not quite just the whole aim. 
in a way the whole aim because you will still look at all the other nuances which emerge from it. But having had this, all the rest becomes obvious. Now you will recall going back two chapters to the chapter called Oneness where Sri Aurobindo had these two very dramatic statements. The complete realization of unity is therefore the essence of the integral knowledge and of the integral yoga. To know Satchidananda, one in himself and one in all his manifestation is the basis of knowledge. To make that vision of oneness real to the consciousness in its status and in its action and to become that by merging the sense of separate individuality in the sense of unity with the being and all beings is its effectuation in the yoga of knowledge. To live, think, feel, will and act in that sense of unity is its, effectua is its effectuation in the individual being and the individual life. Oh. The first sentence was simply the complete realization of unity is therefore the essence of the integral yoga, knowledge and of the integral yoga. The rest is only elaborating how this unfolds in our life. The second dramatic sentence is just after this. This realization of oneness and this practice of oneness indifference is the whole of the yoga. So this realization of oneness and this practice of oneness indifference, you mean everything in, in life, every experience, every contact, every interaction, is nothing but oneness meeting oneness indifference. So the practice of oneness indifference and at the same time in your consciousness you live in the realization of oneness. This is the whole of the yoga. Now on the one hand this is so complete, on the other hand after this the mind can still say but what about? And so that will still be addressed later. But this being clear, all the whatabouts become almost self-evident. And Sri Aurobindo will still take us through step by step and take up the most difficult whatabouts questions and show you how in the oneness it's so obvious and so simply, spontaneously, effortlessly resolved. So we come back to the text. That is why we have had to insist first and foremost on oneness as the aim and in a way the whole aim of our yoga of knowledge. And having got to this beautiful vision, everything as Satchidananda and oneness meeting oneness in infinite unending diversity, never losing oneness. You see our mind thinks that as the oneness becomes more and more divided, it gets into matter, it got lost into ignorance and in conscience. The divine was lost. That's how the mind thinks. But no, the divine oneness still holds in that extreme division, the oneness is never lost. It is still Satchidananda. And in the life divine, Sri Aurobindo shows you how to address the mind's doubt. He shows, look at the subatomic particle, what is it? It is consciousness turning upon itself, dwelling on its own singular existence, the Sat, in utter entire concentration of awareness, the Chit, and holding itself by its power of awareness, the Chit Tapas, the concentrated energy of the Chit, and blissfully immersed in this self-meditation, so to say. I'm paraphrasing the idea, but... And that is the ananda. The subatomic particle of the inconscient, extreme division of consciousness is still Satchidananda focusing upon one tiny focal point. And each particle is thus Satchidananda. And the whole is held as foam of the ocean of Satchidananda, never separate in the oneness. And the oneness in the particle still exists, held back as if from its exclusive concentration in the front on its narrowness. But it is still there. The oneness holds it and it contains secretly within it the oneness of all the rest. 
And therefore, when this particle moves in relation to that particle, they are attracted or repelled. You cannot explain the attraction and repulsion if not for the fact that it knows the other is there. And so its oneness is secret but still active. And so the particles are aligned, pulled to each other. And when a large number of particles fall into place, they align themselves in beautiful geometric patterns. We call it forces. But that is our interpretation of the way they express their relationship of oneness in multiplicity. Always Satchidananda choosing itself freely, nothing limits it. And so we put to it a mental formula, oh it has to be like this because there is a force which is pulling. But where did the force come from? It is still the consciousness knowing itself and activating itself as the Chit Shakti. And so you see ultimately, however deep you go into matter and the division of consciousness, it is still Satchidananda entirely holding itself, but in an appearance of concealing itself, but still Satchidananda and oneness. If not for that, you could not have had the awakening of evolution. Mother uses the same picture in different vocabulary. She says, what pulls the atoms together, what pulls the subatomic particles together is the consciousness of the oneness in both, reaching out to recover oneness. In other words, love. In other words, the divine love. Because all is Satchidananda and all is oneness, everything knows everything else in the embrace of its oneness which is the divine love. And so it is the love at the very base of creation which brings together this apparent separation and fragmentation, holds it, brings it together and forms out of it all this beautiful scenery that is this universe and continues the building all the way, revealing more and more of its love, of its ananda, of its sat and chit and the chit shakti as it ascends layer by layer all the way back to its full revelation at the top apparently concealed below fully revealed at the top and the full continuity of all the levels in between and all the rich and complex play on each of these levels everything that can possibly be of relationship of oneness with oneness without limits that's the vision we have of the universe and so he says in the next paragraph, but this unity works itself out everywhere and on every plane by an executive or practical truth of duality. While everything is Satchidananda and we recognize and accept this, practically in the working of the play, it takes this double position of Purusha and Prakriti. So, by an executive of pra or practical truth of duality, something which holds the poise of the Sat and something which emanates or expresses the poise of the Chit consciousness and the Chit Shakti energy and their interplay of Ananda. And it appears as if two, but that he says is only a practical truth or an executive truth. It is needed for the sense of separation of form. The eternal, capital E, is the one infinite conscious existence, Purusha, and not something inconscient and mechanical. So for us in the material world, because that consciousness is concealed, it looks like mechanical. It happens, there's only force, but I don't see the consciousness. But it's always the eternal, is the one infinite conscious existence, Purusha, and not something inconscient and mechanical. It exists eternally in its delight of the force of its own conscious being founded on an equilibrium of unity. So what is this eternal infinite conscious existence doing? It is existing in its delight. What is it delighting in? The force of its own conscious being. 
flowing out. So there is the existence which is conscious and the force of the consciousness and the pouring of that force is the delight of this eternal. But what is this pouring out consciousness force? What is the delight based on? Founded in an, eter in, in an equilibrium of unity. That is even as it pours out, everything flowing out is held in relation to everything else in the underlying unity. It's not as if, <clears throat> it's not as if this goes out there and that goes out there, separate, conflicting. It is always held in the oneness. The basis is the oneness, the unity in which the full flowing out of the force take pla takes place. That is why the flowing out of the force never conflicts with anything else. It is perfectly in alignment with every other facet of the force flowing out. A streaming, laminar, effortless, no turbidity, no confusion, no conflict, perfectly aligned, effortless in its flow. And it is only at the lowest levels, once in that flow it has created the sense of separate form, it pretends to play in collision of forces, when in fact it is entirely conscious of the other force in the collision itself and knows the other to be itself for the purpose of the play. <clears throat> now, if you watch this as an exercise, when my hand wrestles against my other hand, and the right hand pulls hard enough to pull the left hand, and then now the left hand pulls harder and pulls against the right, and the right hand now pulls still harder. You see what's happening? Both know each other in the one consciousness, and yet for the purpose of the play, they set up this relationship of pulling or pushing, but perfectly aligned. As this increases the pull, that other yields to the pull, although staying itself, knowing the other to have a greater force. And then it grows yielding. And if you look at it from the Satchidananda view, the very point of the push is nothing but a point of contact of delight in which I meet myself in a play. And so seen from that view, it is as if a masquerade, a drama put up. And yet in the drama, each experiences the joy of the sense of opposition, never really opposed. So the idea here is, it exists eternally in its delight of the force of its own conscious being, founded in an equilibrium of unity. Everything is perfectly balanced in the unity, nothing missing nothing in excess, perfectly aligned in the unity. But, it exists also in the no less eternal delight of its force of conscious being at play with various creative self-experiences in the universe. So although there is this equilibrium, which is the base, at the same time he says, the delight of its force of conscious being at play and now you set aside the idea of equilibrium. It's as if one force meeting other objects and being surprised, as if not knowing. So at the same time, there is this also play of various creative self-experiences in the universe. And there is, so there is one level where everything is known in the perfect equilibrium and then another level where there is the surprise and the play of a different kind. Just as, and he gives an example, we ourselves are or can become aware of being always something timeless, nameless, perpetual, which we call ourself, and which constitutes the unity of all that we are. And yet simultaneously we have the various experiences of what we do, think, will, create, become, such too is the self-awareness of this Purusha in the world. And by giving this example, he is suggesting something profound. That we, as a reflection of that poise of the Purusha, also experience this double status of the play, although in a very limited, narrowed and diluted, maybe even distorted form. But we have a double status. What is that? So if I ask you, 
what are you like in the purity of your awareness not as a personality not as the person who can be many things what is the quality of your awareness if you get back even as a mental awareness you get back to the quality of your mind which is aware and the pure awareness that you hold you become very still and quiet and you're simply aware what does this awareness feel like it feels as if first that it is eternal timeless it always exists i'm aware there's no beginning there's no end i may not have memory but the awareness feels it doesn't depend on time it's always there and nameless you could put any name on it it's just awareness itself does not have any name definition or form perpetual continues to be even as time flows it continues to be and in a sense it's always new even as time passes it's always new it is so we have this poise which we call i yet simultaneously we have various experience of what we do think create become so when you do something who is doing it this awareness is now doing this i reach out take the flower from what from this awareness i think should i take this flower or that which will be better as a gift who's thinking this awareness i will to put this and arrange it in a particular way i create a beautiful bunch of a bouquet i become now the artist the decorator the painter still i have become this artist the same one who was in its base this timeless nameless perpetual awareness and you have a double experience in the same way in the sachidananda there is a double experience always there is this oneness in equilibrium of oneness and at the same time there is this aspect and force and play of the oneness putting up different facets and forms in the play surprising itself creating in different ways only we being at present limited and ego bound mental individuals have usually this experience in the ignorance and do not live in the self but only look back at it or draw back to it from time to time while the eternal has it in his infinite self knowledge is eternally this self and looks from the fullness of self being at all this self experience so what's the difference between us and that just this we are bound ego bound limited mental individuals at present he is very careful to say that being at present limited doesn't mean we'll be like that forever but being in this we do not live in the self so we are lost in the movement or we are bound to it in some way and then every now and then we step back and say oh but what do i really want because it is there we are able to look back or draw back while the eternal has it in his infinite self knowledge he lives in the self is the self so is eternally this self and looks from the fullness of self being at all this self experience unlike our ego center which looks at partiality of its self being i am insufficient i am incapable i lack all these things and that defines my drive in the self i am complete the whole universe is me i lack nothing what do i live for only for the joy of what fulfilling myself drawing out possibilities for the purpose of the play i don't even need to do it because it's all there within me but in my freedom i choose to play it 
In my freedom I could choose to withdraw the game. In my freedom I could burst out into a new direction in the game. So the self, while the self has it in his infinite self-knowledge, all possibilities are there, nothing is lacking, is eternally this self and looks from the fullness of self-being. He can never lose that poise, he's eternally in it. And from that fullness looks at what? This self-experience. Everything is myself experiencing myself in the oneness. He does not, like us bound prisoners of the mind, conceive of his being as either a sort of indefinite result and sum, or else a high contradiction of self-experience. So he is contrasting that poise with our poise. What do we look at ourselves as? What do we find ourselves to be? First he says, bound prisoners of the mind. You are bound, you can't get free. As an example, if someone tells you, okay, now please step back from your mind. If you are not mind, step back from it. How do I do that? Even a basic question at an early stage is, someone says, stop thinking. How do I do that? I am thinking that I should stop thinking. How do I even stop it? Right? The more we try to stop thoughts, the more they seem to agitate more by the very nature of your effort. How do you do that? And the breakthrough happens only when you experience what it's like to be in a thoughtless awareness. And the moment you get to that, you say, ah, that's what it is. I don't stop thinking, I step back from the thinking process and become awareness. And then from there I can stop the thought if I want. And in the same way, well, wake up, get out of your mind, get into self. What do you mean? How do I do that? So as, I, as long as I'm thinking of self, it doesn't happen. When I become very quiet, I become conscious of a stillness which is behind, deeper, more tangible, more complete. And it's as if I shift back to lean in it, rest in it. And after a while, the sense of mind awareness begins to become more superficial, less true. And a different kind of awareness which is complete, real in itself emerges or grows in me, dawns, so to say. Until I am more in that, less in this. I can still have mind, I can still think, but I am not the thinking part, I am not even the mind awareness. I am this base which has a mind awareness. And so this poise is what you, so to say, shift into, grow into. But right now, in the very act of thinking, you have bound yourself in mind. So he says, bound prisoners of the mind. He does not, like us bound prisoners of the mind, conceive of his being as either a sort of indefinite result and sum. So first, we, when we think, who am I? I am this person who likes this food, who likes those clothes, who likes to ride a horse, who likes to bungee jump, or who's very shy, who's very likable. And all these different pieces of qualities, psychological qualities accumulated, make for I. Or, I am just this sense of awareness that I am, which has all these qualities, but maybe they don't define me, but there's this vague sense of a center around which these qualities are, so to say, formed. So these are two ways in which a sort of indefinite result and some things added up or result of all these things which have developed over time. Today what I am is the result of all those experiences that I had. I'm going to digress a little bit, but for those of you who watch um, television serials, you will find this, this idea now being explored more and more in science fiction cinema uh, and even TV series. There is one series called Westworld, which, uh, in which human beings create a robotic humanity, which is almost a perfect replica of human beings in form, but also in behavior. So the whole thing builds on how they are taught to imitate through
through many iterations of some kind of programming and then by self-referencing to their own past memories, they build up and grow into these very complex human-like beings. And at some point the question comes, are you human or are you the robot? And the robot answers, if you can't differentiate, does it matter? And the series then explores deeper into the sense of individuality and uh, coming to the center of what is the sense of I? Can the robotic thought process grow into that? And eventually the robots now start analyzing the human beings and they say, well, if you could describe human beings as a bundle of these habits and we describe as a bundle of these habits, which is more rich? And they come to the conclusion they are better formed than the human beings who are quite primitive in their bundle of habits. And there is also this idea that if you could replicate a person's bundle of habits and thought patterns and behavior completely and put it in the robot, effectively it would be that person. And you couldn't distinguish one from the other, isn't it? Now these are the kinds of questions which we come up with when we begin to explore our sense of I. Of course, in the reality, the experience is very different because, just as a quick example, if a robot were to come to you, who is a perfect replica of your body, of a body, human body, with mind, behavior, and so on, you would notice you do not feel the energy field of the aura. Straight away, it's, a, it's an expose. Someone walks in, looks and talks like perfectly like a human being, but I don't feel the energetic connect. Is it a human? No, obviously not. Interesting. Suppose now we even build a human being which has the energy connect. Okay? So the human being approaches, you feel the energy, but it feels inhuman. This is what happens in subtle worlds. If you've ever been in dream state, where something invites you. Today somebody was sharing an incident, an experience in dream, where she was on the border of a river and her mother was calling her from the other side, come. And it was a suggestion of leaving this life to make a transition into the other world. And then this woman looked at her mother's eyes. First she noted she didn't feel the warmth from her mother. Then she looked at the eyes and the eyes were cold and she realized it was not her mother, it was some other being that wanted to, well, trick her. Why? You felt the quality of the consciousness inside. In the eyes, what are you looking at? There's this famous uh, saying that the eyes are like windows of the soul. You sense something much deeper and there you know, you recognize. We are not just a bundle of these behavior patterns. There's something deeper which is truly us. Because that is the case, we sense it in others. Only it is happening at a level which is so deep that we are not fully conscious of what happens. I met somebody and I did not feel right. What was that not feel right? I can't say. But it happened on some deeper level when I sensed at a much deeper and so we realize in our surface experience of mind, as bound prisoners of the mind, we feel our being to be an indefinite result and sum of all these things, result of past experiences, sum of these characteristics, or else a high contradiction of self-experience. On the other extreme, it's not a gathered, organized unit, but I love to do this, but I also like to do that. I live for my ideals, but I have these strong passions which are contrary to my ideals. And you have different parts pulling in different directions. And you could even define yourself in what are the different directions in which you are pulled and pushed. Interestingly, a lot of these ideas are also played upon in this series which I mentioned, Westworld, where they try to form a personality. How do you do that? And so what they do is, they create what is called the cornerstone of personality, upon which the whole thing is built. And it is to make a person empathic. So there's one character whose child died 
and he tried to save him in the hospital he couldn't and in his own arms the child died that one event now has strongly imprinted literally defining his personality and behavior towards everyone else so that's like the cornerstone around which all the other memories and behavior patterns are filled but at the same time because of that empathic aspect from there he also has violent hatred towards something which also comes from the same thing pulling pushing in different directions all these contrary things are held or bound around this cornerstone and this is what you see here we are either the sum total result of many things which built us or a high contradiction of self experience when i look into myself i am this and i am that which are totally contradictory and well that's how it is if you combined all these different contradictory pulls and pushes would that still define me no there is something else even more essential you could erase all these pulls and pushes there would still be this essentiality that would be me and that's what happens when we transition from one life to the next we shed all these layers and the personality which formed it and we withdraw as this essential consciousness that takes on now a completely different personality with a different bundle of patterns and pulls and pushes and still it has the sense of continuity i transition through many lives and i had those experiences but now i am totally different in my form and personality so he does not the divine does not like us bound prisoners of the mind conceive of his being as either a sort of indefinite result and sum or else a high contradiction of self experience and so he says the old philosophical quarrel between being and becoming is not possible to the eternal self knowledge you see in the mind being is my consciousness becoming is what i do the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak my consciousness and my action of consciousness are split up they are not always aligned i want to be nice to you but i can't help it i get agitated and i get upset and they're different things but to the eternal self knowledge it is one infinite self knowledge eternally this self looks from the fullness of self being at this self experience which is his own oneness meeting himself in every possible way no difference between being and becoming it is always being which is always becoming only as being so this big difference he has placed before us as the unity works itself out everywhere on every plane it uses this practical truth of duality an active force of conscious being which realizes itself in its powers of self experience its powers of knowledge will self delight self formulation with all their marvelous variations inversions conservations and conversions of energy even perversions is what we call prakriti or nature in ourselves as in the cosmos but behind this force of variation is the eternal equilibrium of the same force in an equal unity which supports impartially governs even as it has originated the variations and directs them to whatever aim of its self delight the being the purusha has conceived in its consciousness and determined by its will or its power of consciousness that is the divine nature into unity with which we have to get back by our yoga of self knowledge we have to become the purusha sachidananda delighting in a divine individual possession of its prakriti and no longer mental beings subject to our egoistic nature 
for that is the real man the supreme and integral self of the individual and the ego is only a lower and partial mani manifestation of ourselves through which a certain limited and preparatory experience becomes possible and is for a time indulged i am reading quickly because this is going to be our exploration for the next uh, session but it completes the thought the whole discussion that there is this extraordinary self experience pouring out self delight self formulation marvelous variations and then he uses a series of words inversions converge conservations conversions of energy even perversions all this we will explore the various ways in which the energy pours out and that we call prakriti in ourselves and in the cosmos and behind is this eternal equilibrium of the same force in equal unity supporting impartially that is being and in the delight of that being the purusha and it is this divine nature in which that part of the purusha and the prakriti are held in one continuity it is this that we have to get back to by the yoga of self knowledge we become the purusha sachidananda delighting in possession of prakriti no longer as mental beings with the ego center limiting we may still hold the ego as a temporary focus but we are not it and you can indulge for a while he says but this indulgence of the lower being is not our whole possibility it is not the soul or crowning experience for which we exist as human beings even in this material world and while you can have that ego and the ego experience that's not the point of it we can be in the material world in the limited individual body without that ego as participant of this blissful play of the divine nature and as awakened purusha that is going to be our goal and how that will be and that's why the theme of this chapter is the soul and its liberation but it will be with the liberation of nature also in this awakened divine nature and this is the goal he is points us to now the whole section which we have read today including this last paragraph completes the theme of the chapter recall he started with one sweep accept the relationship this relationship of purusha and prakriti it commits us to not rejecting nature it commits us to relating to the whole world and to all beings in the world equally and accepting nature but not as it is not as we are we have to rise out of this ego mental limitation to this higher poise and where we experience nature itself in this awakened character and this is going to be now the nature of the liberation that we will seek by the yoga of self knowledge we must get back to this divine nature of unity and so this whole paragraph which i have just read now we will take up in detail next friday and then continue into the process of how this is to be and all the complexities of the relationship that we hold from that poise and he will deal here remember this is a pause chapter to reconsider now the whole perspective of the yoga and our goal and so we will consider all the different solutions also which have been offered by various traditions in relation to nature and even in relation to a higher nature and bring a deeper clarity from this foundation of unity of sachidananda and we'll see everything as not only so obvious but the most important gift of having read this is shri rubindo makes it for you not only obvious but the only aim worthwhile in life and while it may take time while i may have many parts which may wander through and demand their momentary and partial satisfactions once you have seen this picture you can never fall back into the old values this will always be your reference and you will know this is the direction in which we have to grow towards only this will satisfy but also that this is possible otherwise you're left with contradictions and you say well we have to compromise between this or that 
no no compromise all as one sachidananda one unity meeting its own diversities and this is possible it's obvious rationally the mind is convinced the heart is drawn to that ideal and our life is naturally dedicated to this not yet alone we still have many other interests but they become peripheral or they assist or they turn gradually to point in this direction bit by bit and that's fine bit by bit all our interests will begin to move towards this and then eventually when all of our nature turns all of our consciousness is aligned we'll see this alone but in the midst of all our activities nothing is left out everything that is given and required is accepted but with this goal so this is a very powerful passage by dwelling upon it we imprint the vision the ideal and feel in our mind and heart the truth of it and we feel it because that part within us where we are self knows this already and when it is awakened in the mind as a vision that immediately supports and fills this vision with the truth you say ah yes i know it's true because that fills it that fills the mind's vision and so it's a very precious gift life changing when we dwell upon it